Hi guys, this video today is going to talk about how to graph linear inequalities. Um, and like a lot of things that we've been talking about, this will be some review, but a good refresher hopefully. So first of all, we're talking about inequalities. What does an inequality represent? How many answers are there? In other words, if I said, for instance, x is less than 3, how many answers are there? How many are less than 3? Well, there's infinite, right? And if it's just x is less than 3, then we do that on a number line, and we show that on a number line. But what if it is not just a simple answer like that uh, with one variable? What if it's a two variable answers? In that case, we graph and we shade the whole plane, the whole like half of the graph paper, basically. So that's what we're going to talk about. So remember that um, we use a couple of different notations. We use a dotted line when we're talking about less than or greater than, and we use a solid line when we're talking about less than equal to and greater than equal to. All right, so what we do is we shade the line, and then we have to decide, excuse me, we graph the line, and then we have to decide which way to shade. And so how do you know which way to shade and what is the most common test point? Let's talk about that maybe after we do an example. First of all, just graphing the line itself. I recommend before you start graphing, looking at it and deciding, is this going to be a dotted line or a solid line? It's going to be a dotted line because there's not an equal sign, so we will have a dotted line. This line is in slope-intercept form, so we can just graph it using slope-intercept form. So I'm going to go to my negative 2, and I'm going to go up 4 and write 1, up 4, write 1, or down 4, left 1. And now I'm going to connect those points, but I want to connect them with a dotted line, not a solid line. Okay, so here's what my line is going to look like. Now let's talk about that question we skipped just a second ago. How do you know which way to shade and what is the most common test point? There are a couple of different ways to decide which way to shade. One way is the easiest way. Okay, the easiest way is if y is less than or less than or equal to, then shade below. And if y is greater than or greater than or equal to, then shade above. Let's think about that. First of all, it has to be in the form starting with a y. If it doesn't start with a y, you can't use this rule. This rule is only a shortcut and it can only be used if it starts with y is less than or y is greater than. But think about it. The y is the up and down, right? So if y is less than, then doesn't it make sense that we would shade below the line? Whereas if y is greater than, doesn't it make sense that we would shade above? Notice I'm not saying left and right because it's a y that we're focusing on. So we're focusing on the y-axis, and if y is less than, it's down here in the y below part, whereas if it's y is greater than, it's up here in the y above part. So I'm going to go ahead and shade this in. It is less than, so I'm going to shade it in. As far as the shading goes, you don't have to go crazy. Um, it doesn't have to be like super black, sharpie black. It can just be shaded in. Now, it does need to be dark enough that I can see it because I'm grading your paper, so I need to be able to see it. Also, it should at least extend to the edges of the little graph paper. Um, if it goes farther than that, that's fine, but it has to go and cover the entire area. Okay, that is if y is less than or if y is greater than, it would be up here. Let's do another example. Example number two. Remember we talked about the cover-up example with these. This is in standard form. So if I plug in a 0 for x, I'm going to cover up that term, and I'm going to take 24 divided by 4, that's 6. Whereas if I plug in a 0 for y, I'm going to plug a 0 in here that cancels that one out, so I can cross that out. And then I can look at 24 divided by 3 is 8. And so now when I graph this, I'm going to graph up here at 6, because it's 0, 6, so 0, 6. And then 8, 0, once again, I should have used different graph paper, but here we are. So let's say that this is 8, 0 is here. 
Okay, one thing I didn't do, and I should have, but before I draw it, I definitely need to do is look and decide is this going to be dotted or solid. Well, that's going to be solid, right? So I'm going to get my straight edge, and I'm going to draw this line connecting my 6 with my 8. And again, we've been talking about how many points do you need to have to make a line. Um, with the intercepts, it's really, you just have two. You have the y-intercept and you have the x-intercept. Now, you could put some extra points on there if they went through specific points. Um, so, what I'm thinking of, the slope of this goes down 6 and over 8. And if it goes down 6 and over 8, that really is equivalent to 3 fourths. So I should be able to go down 3 and over 4. Since I didn't have my points actually on the graph, it's a little bit off. But if you wanted to put another point in there, you could. That's not really necessary, but that's another way to get another point if you need another point. Okay, and it was a solid line because it was equal to, so it is solid. Now, this rule, if y is less than or less than equal to, shade below, and if y is greater than or greater than or equal to, then shade above, that does not work with this situation because this is not in slope-intercept form, so we can't really do it with this one. What we do instead is we come up with a test point. And what I mean by test point is you want to just pick a random place out here on the graph. You could pick any point. We could pick this point. We could pick this point. We could pick this point. We could pick anything on the entire graph. The most common test point, though, would be the easiest one to plug in. Of all the numbers on this entire grid, which one is the easiest to plug in? I personally think 0, 0 is the easiest to plug in. So we're going to take 0, 0, and we're going to plug it in to this equation. So for instance, I'm going to have 3 times 0 plus 4 times 0 is less than or equal to 24. All right, when we do that, let's see what we come up with. That's 0 plus 0, so that says 0 is less than or equal to 24. Now you have to ask yourself, is that true or false? Well, it's true. It is less than... 24. 0 is less than 24. If it is true, that means you do shade on that side of the line. If this was false, then we wouldn't shade on that side of the line. We would go to the other side of the line because in that case this would have made it true or some other point over here. So you just need to pick one point. Usually 0, 0 is the easiest. And if it's true there, you will shade on that side. If it's false there, you won't shade on that side. The only problem with this one is what if it goes through the 0, 0? What if it's already going through the origin? If it's already going through the origin, you're going to have to pick a different number, like, I don't know, 10, 10, or negative 2, 1, or, you know, whatever is an easy number to you to plug in. But if 0, 0 is available, let's use it. Let's write some of this down in this space up here. Okay, so our rule is if 0, 0 makes the statement true, shade on the 0, 0 side. If 0, 0 makes the statement false, then don't shade on the 0, 0 side. Go to the other side instead. So this rule, this plugging in 0, 0 rule, will always work. And so it is the guaranteed way to get the right shading. This rule over here on the left, that only works if it's in, basically if it's in slope-intercept form. And so something to keep in mind. You have two methods. One is a shorter method, but it only works for slope-intercept. The other one is a little bit longer, but it always works. Okay, as always, if you have questions, write down questions in the margin. We're about to turn the page. Okay, as we look at this example, we're going to do a couple of word problems. In the next couple of weeks, we're really going to be focusing a lot on some word problems. So we're going to keep practicing on these. Um, you are saving money to go on spring break. You start with $45 in your savings account and you add $15 per week. How long will it take you to save at least $350? Okay, when you read through this problem, you should be thinking of slope-intercept form.
because here's the things to look for. In slope-intercept form, the slope is usually with the word per or maybe each, but any time you see the word per or sometimes even the word each, that tells you that that's some kind of a slope. The B, depending on the type of problem it is, might be the starting amount or it might be any kind of one-time amount. But typically it's your starting amount, but it could be a one-time amount. But let's look. So you're saving money to go on spring break. You start with $45 in your savings account. That tells me that that's the starting point. That's my B. And you add $15 per week. That word per tells me that that's my slope. How long will it take you to save at least $350? Okay, so I'm going to start just with my basic y equals mx plus b. I'm kind of spacing it out so that I have room to work with. I'm going to have y equals $15 per week as my m, so that's why my x is in there with it, plus the starting amount, which is 45 Now one more thing is they talked about this how long will it take you to save at least $350? So I'm actually going to change this now and say that I want to save $350 and I have to decide which way to point my sign. So should $350 be more than this amount or should this amount be more than $350? This amount should be more than $350. So that's my equation. Now I just need to solve that equation. I'm going to come over here and rewrite it so I have some space to work. All right, so I'm going to set it up. I'm going to start solving it by subtracting 45. So that gives me 305 is less than or equal to 15. I need to divide by 15. Now I'm going to need my calculator for this because this does not go in evenly. So I'm going to go to my calculator and I'm going to do my division. And I get 20.3. Um, one thing is, I've been trying to emphasize, we really want to change that to point the other way because it just doesn't make much sense the way it was a minute ago. Um, and it's actually 20.3 repeating, isn't it? And so what is x? Well, let's go back. We should have defined it ahead of time, but let's we go back. Um, you're adding $15 per week. Okay, if it says per week, then the 15 is your m but the week is your x. So this is in weeks. And so how long will it take you to save at least $350? 20 and 1 third weeks, or you could just say 21 weeks. So that's just an example of how to set up an inequality using the slope intercept form. Okay, example number two. You are selling cookie dough to raise money for the upcoming band trip. Chocolate chip cookie dough sells for $12 per tub, and peanut butter sells for $10 per tub. Your goal is to raise at least $120. How many of each type of dough should you sell? This is a kind of word problem I call two types word problems. And when we have this thing called two types word problems, we use standard form. It's like you've got two types of dough. So if we have two types of dough, we're going to have this format. In this format, the A and the AX and the BY stand for different things almost every time. So you don't always know what those stand for. However, the C all, always will stand for the total. Okay, so let's take a second to read through here. We have chocolate chip cookie dough and we have peanut butter cookie dough. And our question, and this is what the important thing is of the variables, the question will almost always tell you what the variables are. So it says how many of each type of dough should you sell? That means that one type of dough is going to be our x, the other type of dough is going to be the y. I always just go in the order that it says it in the sentence. So x is the chocolate chip cookie dough, and Y is the peanut butter cookie dough. And actually it's per tub. So this is each tub. So it's the chocolate chip cookie dough tubs and the peanut butter cookie dough cubs, uh, tubs. 
chocolate chip is twelve dollars per tw per tub so that's twelve dollars per tub for chocolate chip peanut butter is ten dollars per tub and your goal is to raise at least one hundred twenty dollars okay your notes were supposed to have a large graph on them and I think at least on my version that fell off so I'm going to take a minute to draw a graph and when I draw this graph all I really need is the first quadrant and we'll talk about that here in just a second okay so the reason we only need the first quadrant if you think about it can you have negative number of tubs no, you can't. And so we're going to put the chocolate chip tubs on this side and the peanut butter tubs on this side. Now, because the Y is the peanut butter, so my Y axis and the X is the chocolate chip, so my X axis. Your axes have to match up with the variables how you define them. So however you define them, that's how you're going to set up your graph. So to, this is a standard form equation. For standard form, I do the cover-up method. And so if I plug in a 0 for x and I cover that up, I take 120 divided by 10, that's 12. If I plug in a 0 for y, I cover this up and I get 120 divided by 12, and that's 10. Okay, so I'm going to set up my axes and I'm going to count by 2s. Um, you can count by whatever you want to. I just counted by 2s. So my y-intercept is at 12 and my x-intercept is at 10 and I'm going to connect them and we want to think about should I connect them with a solid line or a dotted line and that should be a solid line because it's okay to make exactly $120 alright but we want to raise at least $120 so if I plugged in my my method of plugging in zeros, if I plug in a test point of 0, 0, I would get 0 plus 0 is greater than 120. Is 0, 0, is 0 greater than 120? No, it's not. So I come down here and here's my 0, 0 point. I do not want to shade that. I'm going to shade up here instead. Okay, let's make some meaning of this graph. What this graph means is, and if this was on grid paper, we could see it better. But for instance, it means I could sell 14 chocolate chip and 4 peanut butter, and I would make more than $120. I could make six chocolate, or sell 6 chocolate chip and 12 peanut butter, and I would make more than $120. Any point I can find out here is going to make more than $120. Any point that's on the line, how much is that going to make me? That's going to make me exactly $120. So any point along this line would bring in exactly $120. Any point up here in the shaded area would bring in more than $120. And guess what? Anything in this area that's not shaded in, that means I didn't make my goal. I didn't make at least $120. Okay. So those are some a couple of examples of word problems. Like I said, we're going to be focusing a lot on word problems in the next couple of weeks. Write your questions in the margin. Any questions that you have, write them in the margin. The other thing is there are some lines here for summary, and you know that if there's lines here, we need to write in a summary. Maybe you could write when you use standard form, when you use slope-intercept form. Maybe you could write when you use a dotted line, when you use a solid line. Maybe you could write how to decide which way to shade. Okay, whatever, but you need to write something in this lines for summary. And then tomorrow in class we will work some more on the inequalities.